Hannover Medical School, and I would like to welcome you to the next lecture of the E3CT eSchool. So the E3CT, or the European Society for Gene and Cell Therapy, is a nonprofit organization aiming to promote fundamental and clinical research in gene therapy, cell therapy, and genetic vaccines. And part of our mission is education and training, and we therefore launched the eSchool series. And uh, as you know, part one is dedicated to the delivery system, and we provided you already with insights on lentiviruses, retroviruses, adeno, and AEV. You heard about nonviral vectors. And we close this first part with a lecture by Professor Urs Greber from the University of Zurich in Switzerland. And so Professor Greber um, studied experimental biology and biotechnology in Switzerland and then went to the Scripps University or Research Institute in La Jolla before moving to the Yale University and then coming back to the University of Zurich where he is holding a professorship. And he has a lot of awards and honors and so the most recent one is that he is the Uh, elected president of the Life uh, Science Swiss Switzerland. And to, you, to know this as a society which helps researchers setting up meetings and have networks and so on. So I'm very much looking forward into the uh, talk and the lecture of Professor Greber because he is really a vi virologist. And always, if I read something or see that a new paper is coming up, I'm one, I hope, one of the first reading it because it's very exciting. And therefore, we are really looking forward to his lecture, which is entitled, Learn from Viruses to Improve Viral and Non-Viral Vectors. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much, Hildegard, for these kind words of introduction. I'm very happy to speak here uh, remotely to you. Uh, through this video um, arrangement. Um, for me, it's the first kind of lecture over, um, over the ether like that. So I hope that you will um, uh, not get lost and I will be clear enough in order to uh, make the point and uh, try to explain you what we are doing and what we are interested in, why we think viruses are so interesting. Obviously, viruses these days have, are in the headlines all the time. And um, There's lots of, um, lots of news going on, uh, rapid news, uh, excitement, as well as anxiety. Uh, so <clears throat> I used to tell my students that those who don't know the viruses, they are afraid of them. But once you know them, you are less afraid of them. So <clears throat> we would like to uh, learn from viruses and how they work and inform about perhaps how to use Um, how, what viruses are doing best uh, for therapeutic ways as well. And this is probably your main interest to apply um, the essence of viruses to uh, engineer and to treat disease, engineer um, uh, technology and treat disease. So <clears throat> uh, briefly, um, I studied uh, at the ETH uh, um, experimental biology and went, as Hildegard said, to the Scripps Institute as a postdoc to learn cell biology, nuclear transport. Then I was a research associate at the Yale Medical School uh, with Ari Hellenius. And there I was fascinated by the viruses, actually, uh, working on a cell entry project. Uh, the simple question, how does a virus get the DNA into the nucleus? And this is a question that looked simple, but turned out to be uh, very uh, complex. And we are still working on that problem, on, on, that, on many other problems as well. But uh, we are still fascinated by this problem. And, and there's more to learn, I think, even 30 years uh, uh, from now, uh, when I started. <clears throat> uh, then I became assistant associate full professor at the University of Zurich. And in uh, some, some years ago, actually, uh, together with colleagues, we founded a, a small startup company here in Zurich, uh, 3D Biosciences, uh, that is now developing therapeutics um, against uh, host functions. In particular, uh, uh, the program they have right now is uh, fatty acid synthesis inhibitors to treat uh, not only virus infections, but also cancer and, um, and NASH and non-alcoholic cell hepatitis. So uh, this was some time ago, actually, and uh, um, was bringing together our interest in viruses with a, an aim to use this knowledge uh, to develop therapeutics. <clears throat> so what are the topics today? Um, I'd like to go through this list, uh, briefly discuss with you what is a virus, 
what does a virus do, uh, what a virion do, and how we build a virion, or how one can think conceptually of building a virion. And then I'd like to see what are the emerging features of a virion. It's not just an assembly of things, but it's an assembly of things that has certain properties, and these properties are emerging from the way they assemble and uh, are put together. And then this leads then to the question of how does this virus then behave in a system, in, a, in an organism or in a cell, or um, how does it um, then essentially cause disease or can be used potentially therapeutically. And then there's many other further issues um, about natural viruses that are important also to consider eventually uh, when making vectors. So what is a virus actually? So we distinguish between the virion um, and the infected cell. Right, so the virion is uh, something that is a small entity. Um, now, I don't have a, a pointer here, unfortunately. I cannot, um, I think I cannot point this. You can use your oh, mouse. Oh, no, I can use it. Okay, so yeah, okay, now it goes. Yeah, okay, it's doing something. <laughs> it's a bit difficult to control. So here's the virion, right? So that's the entity that carries nucleic acid, proteins, and uh, lipids sometimes, and, and, and sugars, and that enters into a cell and turns the cell into a virus, a, a, vi a virion production factory that uh, some, you know, can, uh, can do this inside the nucleus or inside the cytoplasm, some compartments then. And these newly uh, synthesized virion particles, uh, they then egress, emerge, and uh, then are transmitted to other cells or shed into the environment. <clears throat> so this is the distinction, right? Basic distinction. So what does a virion do, uh, the, the, the small entity? So of course it infects a cell, right? So this is essentially what a virus particle is doing. Um, as a particle itself, it's not alive, it's dead, it's just matter. And, but when it interacts with cells, it becomes alive, if you will, and starts to be complex. It does that by binding to the cell, um, to surface receptors, and then it's sometimes, most of the particles in fact are endocytosed into cells, some few cytoplasm membrane, but most of them endocytosed. You can measure this. Um, they then penetrate somehow the endosome and get into the cytosol or transport to the site where they want to replicate then. And one can always measure this. And eventually they dissociate their genome from the capsid. And this is an important step because it's an irreversible step that lays open the genomic information. And that's dangerous because there's innate immunity that recognizes these nucleic acids from viruses. And the virus has to do it uh, in, a, in, a, in the right way. <clears throat> Then uh, if this is successful, <clears throat> the viral genome is eventually replicated, transcribed, and then uh, new particles form through a concerted virus-specific, uh, cell-specific uh, cell sometimes um, uh, replication program, meaning that in some cases a virus can go latent or persistent, in other instances it can become lytic, and then uh, assemble particles that exit the cell and then are being transmitted to other cells in this uh, propagation process. So essentially this is in brief steps, the virus replication cycle. And we try to develop assays, uh, single cell and single variant assays in order to measure all these steps because they, um, they are um, controlled by many different factors and they occur variably in different cell types to different degrees. And so there's a lot of information there. So one of the biggest question there, I guess, is um, what determines the cell to cell variability of infection? And this is a very complex thing, actually, that requires dissection of this complexity into small digestible steps. And this is one way to do it, probably. <clears throat> so then you uh, essentially come out with a virion. But the question is, how do you build a virion? And how, or how does a cell build a virion? How are the components put together? And here I just highlight the uh, workhorse that we've been working on for many years, the adenovirus. And the adenovirus has been crystallized uh, cryo-EM, cryostructures have been derived, and also X-ray structures have been derived uh, from this gigantic uh, assembly. <clears throat> what you see here is an icosahedral particles with a T equals 25 uh, symmetry. I'll come back to this uh, uh, T number in a, in a moment. <clears throat> Essentially, it's a container of proteins and nucleic acids. And it has uh, certain features in the geometry. It has like a threefold axis here in green or a fivefold axis here in, um, in um, magenta or a twofold axis in yellow in this particle. Um, I think, oh, okay, it jumps from, from uh, so in, in, this, in this kind of cartoon here. Uh, no, actually in this, it's not a cartoon, it's, it's, the, it's the structure. 
<clears throat> and then when you break it up and look at the facets of this, of this virus, you see that most of the facet proteins are made up by uh, a trimeric protein called the hexon. And the way it's held together is by small glue proteins, cement proteins, like the protein 9 of the cell on the virion surface. So these are strategically positioned such that the uh, groups of nines are held together in a, in a, in a manner that is stable enough um, for the virion to, um, to transmit this information. And when you look inside um, the, the virion here in a cross section, you see that it's empty. So this is a problem. So we don't have a well-resolved uh, structure of the genome inside the virion with its proteins, uh, but instead it's an unresolved uh, right now, an unresolved uh, mass of, um, of material. Nonetheless, um, the, uh, the interface between the capsid wall and the inside is starting to get resolved. Um, and there is now information here that the, uh, for example, the membrane lytic protein, this protein six here, is tethered uh, to the hexon protein to the inside, one of the cavities here of the hexon protein is holding it. Um, many copies of six exist, uh, over 300, and they are arranged. The important thing is six competes with a viral protein, uh, protein seven, that is making up the uh, organization of the double-stranded DNA genome, competes for binding. And this is, <clears throat> this is very important, actually. I'll come back to that in a second. So the capsid can contain, um, you know, rather, uh, large amounts of DNA. It's up maybe depending on the virion or the, the type of virus um, or antivirus between 26 and 45 or so. You can a little bit over package it, but not much. You get punished by uh, deletion mutants if you over package it too much. <clears throat> so this is essentially the end product. The way it gets put together is, um, is in, in the cell by overexpressing all these uh, capsid uh, components um, such that they can find and assemble themselves in, in by low affinity, uh, high avidity interactions into an emerging particle. And I told you that uh, this virus, antivirus, has a T equals 25 uh, symmetry. That's the triangulation number. And essentially, that derives <clears throat> from um, uh, the larger the T number is, essentially, the more hexagons um, uh, you have uh, compared to the pentagons. So hexagons you have here. Uh, as the major building blocks of this of these icosahedrals here, these these open facets here, uh, open um, uh, um, hexagons <coughs> are uh, are indicating that, and the pentagons are the the dark ones. Um, and and essentially, what you count is the distance between uh, the uh, the pentagons and um, and uh, the successive steps it takes between them. If it's a straight line, uh, the h number is is indicated by that. Uh, number of steps, and if it's a kinked line in the end, there is uh, uh, the uh, essentially a K number equals one coming uh, to it. So, for example, this adenovirus here is T equals 25. So it takes um, four steps from this penton, <coughs> uh, five steps, sorry, from this penton uh, to the next one, and there is no kink here, so the K number is uh, zero. So, according to this formula developed by Krug and Casper, in the 60s already, <clears throat> uh, you derive then uh, this number 25. So, <clears throat> um, I probably jumped out here. Hopefully. So, <clears throat> uh, the antivirus capsid then, as I said, is put together in the nucleus, <clears throat> and there's different capsomers that, that put it together. Um, I will not go into all the details here, but the essence is that fibers and um, and pentons are put separately together and, and they co-assemble. So the fibers are trimers and the pentons are pentamers. So there's a mismatch symmetry here, uh, a threefold versus a fivefold. And that gives flexibility in the way they interact. And that's important also for, for the metastability of the virus, the, the way they release then the fibers and open up the pentons during entry. I'll come back to that. The exon protein is one of the more complicated proteins. It's more than 100 kilodalton in size. And in fact, coincidentally, it featured a, a helper protein, a chaperone, the L400K protein, which was the first chaperone in cells to be uh, discovered already in the 80s. So this protein helps to fold correctly the uh, three-dimensional structure of the, <clears throat> of the hexon uh, to make trimers, and then eventually to assemble uh, into, into capsules. The genome uh, is required for that as well, <clears throat> obviously, to make a virion. 
And uh, this virus here contains essentially uh, early regions um, and also late regions. The early regions are, um, are here on the left side here, E1A, I'll come back to that one. And uh, it has a number of immune modulatory regions here, for example, E3, or also the <coughs> uh, E2 region, which uh, provides helper functions for virion uh, 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 um, uh, propagation like the polymerase or the DNA binding protein, single strand DNA binding protein or terminal protein. And then uh, the later region here contains the capsid proteins <clears throat> that are made late in infection and then eventually give rise to the, to the virion. It also has VARNAs, so they antagonize innate immunity. Uh, PKR, for example, is antagonized, but they also give rise to microRNAs with unknown um, uh, complexity and unknown functions, actually. So importantly, the, the viral uh, genome, which is a double-stranded genome, is um, secured on both sides at the three prime, at the five prime end, sorry, here, by the terminal protein covalently linked to, the, to this linear molecule. And that helps to secure and prevent uh, DNA damage response on this open genome and uh, essentially can, uh, keeps uh, the, the genome um, intact and, uh, and also eventually infectious. So now <clears throat> when we look and start to understand how the genome is organized in these particles, <clears throat> we are learning something new, I think, uh, through the work of Carmen San Martin and others <clears throat> in Spain. Um, we are starting to appreciate that the DNA inside uh, this virion is not homogeneously uh, organized by the DNA binding protein 7 here, but it appears that this uh, that it's organized as as kind of a blobs here. I'll, I call it like this in in, in this sense. So it's kind of organized. And the way <clears throat> this information was derived was from atomic force microscopy, where the experimentalists have uh, uh, hammered on on the virion uh, here in case of the wild type or in the case of a protein seven knockout mutant without any protein seven. Um, and compared the products actually that uh, came, uh, came about. And they could see the DNA uh, as filamentous yellow uh, structures and covered with, um, with um, additional structures in the electron, uh, 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 in the atomic force microscope scans that scans the surface. And these scans then uh, were interpreted to be um, uh, containing uh, protein seven actually as part of the organizer. And then, of the of the genome, so this gives rise to the to the notion that protein seven may be uh, a kind of a focal organizer um, <clears throat> uh, of the of the variant DNA, as opposed to a linear histone-like organizer, as you would have assumed through the old um, uh, hypothesis. Section. So this is pretty exciting, actually. I'm uh, following up on that. So the way the <clears throat> um, uh, one can generate this protein seven minus viruses or variants um, is very interesting. Pat Hearing uh, at Sony Brook has pioneered this system. It's essentially um, uh, engineering uh, locks uh, P sites um, uh, at both sides of the genomic protein 7 locus and then uh, transfecting uh, these DNA um, um, into cells that express the career recombinase, which immediately splices out the, uh, <coughs> this protein 7 uh, locus and gives rise to uh, protein seven lacking variants. And this was a huge surprise. Uh, you can see here the, the data from his paper a few years ago. <clears throat> this is a huge surprise that the, uh, the fact that these variants were formed without protein seven. So <clears throat> um, uh, here you can see the cesium chloride uh, gradient uh, of Cree expressing or Cree negative cells, um, indicating that you do get a very respectable uh, amount of variants. Actually, we, we are using these variants now in the lab as well. We make it ourselves. So this is a very robust uh, protocol that informs us about the function of protein 7 now, not only in the variant packaging, but also perhaps in, <clears throat> in, 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 uh, in the cell infection process. And it's very exciting, actually. So, <clears throat> so this notion, actually, um, that you can form particles without protein 7 <clears throat> um, essentially killed one of the uh, hypotheses for variant assembly in the nucleus, which was um, here crossed out with these red bars, um, <clears throat> uh, was a sort of a, um, 
a, uh, uh, a sequential assembly process where you form a, an empty capsid first. And then like in herpes viruses, you would have a portal uh, that is uh, making, uh, uh, you know, made up of an, of an ATPase that would pump the DNA uh, into the empty, uh, empty shell here. So this doesn't seem to be the case because um, the virion package is in, independent of whether the DNA is complex with protein 7 or not. So this really, uh, together with additional uh, evidence or notions from, um, <clears throat> from um, electron microscopy studies and also immunofluorescence studies here from the, the lab of Carmen San Martin in, in Madrid, uh, suggest <clears throat> now really strongly suggest a co-assembly model where capsomeres come together and DNA, uh, notice synthesized DNA comes together and forms uh, maybe in uh, a liquid unmixed zone in the nucleus, an assembly compartment then that gives rise to these young virions um, depicted here that will then uh, eventually mature towards uh, um, mature virions. So this is uh, quite, um, quite exciting. So, <clears throat> um, so forming a virion actually gives rise to emerging properties, uh, especially physical properties. And this is important also for the way these viruses are infecting. I think this notion is important for everybody who wants to build from scratch virus-like particles with, um, with uh, oligomerizing proteins, capsid-forming proteins, and then maybe even uh, RNA or DNA packaging functions. So these physical properties have emerged in, uh, in viruses uh, uh, through a selection process together with cells, and they are distinct. I'll show you in a second. <clears throat> So the way um, one can learn about them, and, and that was a collaboration also with people in uh, Universities Autonomo in, in Madrid that we had a few years ago, we'll continue on other things, is again by atomic force microscopy. <clears throat> so what the investigators are doing there is they place the variants on, uh, on, a, on, a, on a surface here, and then they take uh, an atomic force microscopic needle and, and start hammering very you know, gently on these particles. <clears throat> and they do that in the presence of a dye, yo-yo uh, one in the medium, that is when the capsid is opened up, um, giving rise to a green fluorescent signal here due to DNA binding. <clears throat> it enters the capsid then. So if you completely destroy the virion, then <clears throat> uh, the capsid goes away and uh, essentially everything gets, gets opened up and, uh, and, 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 <clears throat> and becomes fluorescent. So <clears throat> You get two types of information from this kind of experiment. Uh, one is you get the surface topology of your of your substrate of your virion here, indicated in these in these slides here, and you can see that um, uh, as at the hammering, the slight hammering progresses, that's a mechanical fatigue uh, experiment. <clears throat> uh, you can see that, uh, for example, here in frame 17, um, you see uh, there are holes being formed here um, in the capsid, and these holes are formed at the five-fold axis, uh, five-fold symmetry axis, actually. And coincidentally, as the holes are formed, the virion here becomes fluorescent. So these are really holes that, uh, that let the dye uh, to bind the virion, and eventually that progresses. And you can quantify that. So what you learn from this is <clears throat> that, um, sorry, that um, the five-fold axis here of this icosahedral particle is essentially the weakest spot and you can confirm uh, or uh, validate this notion, and that has been done by independently by a group in the Netherlands <clears throat> uh, who measured the uh, mechanical uh, uh, stiffness um, or the spring constant. So that's the stiffness um, uh, essentially over, uh, over the distance. <clears throat> um, uh, is essentially, uh, the spring constant essentially is the smallest one at the five-fold axis here in green. So you have the, the three symmetry axes here depicted in three colors. Green is the five-fold, uh, uh, red is the three-fold axis, and blue is the two-fold axis. And, and these graphs here show the, the spring constant, meaning the force that you require for a certain amount of indentation by the uh, atomic force microscope indentation into the, into the variant. So <clears throat> the higher the spring constant, the more stiff, the stiffer the, the capsid wall is. And, and this, is, uh, this is showing here. So the green is, is the weakest one, it's the softest one, and then comes the threefold axis and then the, the twofold axis of the, of the axis. 
Now, the interesting thing is now <clears throat> when the experimentalists here started to tune the system by perfusing the variance um, um, under the AFM needle with uh, soluble integrins, for example, and you could see that the soluble integrins now binding to the variance have even further softened the five-fold axis. So they made it even more unstable in a way. In contrast, now, if, if they perfused um, uh, <coughs> the uh, human defense in five, a molecule that binds to the, to the variant and stabilizes the particle and is, is known to be an antiviral preventing on coating uh, on entry, <coughs> then you get the opposite, actually. You get a, a strengthening, a stiffening of the five-fold axis and, uh, and hence uh, a, a lesser infectivity in cells if you do that. So these kinds of things um, are important to consider when, when you look at virus interactions with cells and, and try to interpret what happens in, in, in these cells. <clears throat> and it gives rise to the concept of maturation and pressuring actually to control virus metastability. And metastability is a feature that many viruses have implemented and this is mediated by a limited, for example, by a limited proteolysis event that uh, comes from the, from the immature viruses to the mature viruses. And, and while they do that, uh, they become metastable. They become receptive to the cues that the, that the host cell uh, uh, provides to them when they interact with the host cell. So in the case of the anovirus, you go from an immature variant, <clears throat> which uh, essentially where the DNA is, uh, is, is not very decondensed. It is, is rather compact due to the unprocessed nature of the DNA binding proteins and capsid uh, wall proteins on the inside. So this DNA is, uh, is exerting a rather small pressure towards the outside. So this is a very soft particle, the immature particle. So, and we have a mutant for that, a TS1 particle, that is, um, is, is very soft, immature, and can enter cells by endocytosis, but it cannot disassemble. It cannot read the uncoating cues. This is really uh, uh, the essence of that. So it only reads the uncoating cues. I come back to those uh, when it matures, and the maturation entails that the viral DNA now decondenses in a way, it becomes larger, so it exerts more pressure towards the capsid walls, and the capsid wall gets stiffer. So this has implications then for reading the mechanical cues upon virus entry of these particles. <clears throat> so this brings me to the systemic behavior of the particle when it gets into the cell. So in, in essence, you can conceptually think about this um, as a stepwise gain of function process as the virus gets into, into the cell. So it sheds particle, it sheds proteins, uh, components <clears throat> in, a, in a very strategic way, um, depending on the position where it is in, on the entry pathway. So you go from an intact variant here, you lose proteins, for example, stabilizing proteins, you open up the capsid here um, and, and you make it more receptive to other cues and eventually you dissociate the, the, the genome then from the capsid inside and you lay, lay it open completely. So this happens as a gain of function process for the virus and, and lays open the genome and essentially then makes it, um, makes it transcribable. So in order to do that, the virus interacts with receptors, attachment factors and facilitators. So receptors is something that directly binds to the virus particle and then makes infection happen. An attachment factor is something where the, uh, the host factor binds to the variant, um, but not necessarily leads to an enhancement of infection. It just maybe uh, tethers the virus in proximity of, um, of, of, a, of a receptor or so and, and, and makes it more likely to, to find. And the facilitator is something that is on the cell surface <clears throat> and, um, and can stimulate the infection without contacting the virus directly. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, what, what, with an example for that. <clears throat> so the, uh, this concept is important to understand how the virus can uh, interact with receptors that are by definition hidden in, in, in the cell here. So if you look at the polarized epithelium here, uh, you have in the, in the lung here, for example, you have these polarized cells, <coughs> epithelial cells, you have these immune cells um, or the secretory cells, you have, uh, uh, um, you have uh, <clears throat> macrophages and radic cells and, and others in this epithelium. But essentially the receptor here, the car receptor, is, is not available on the apical surface. It's just not there because it's a cell adhesion molecule 
that homotypically binds between different cells and, and makes the epithelium tight. So how does the virus actually get access to this receptor? That's the big question. So <clears throat> we and others have, um, have found in the past that when you inoculate the virus with macrophages or co-culture epithelial cells with macrophages or dendritic cells, the virus gets recognized by macrophages and taken up. And the macrophage response, it secretes um, uh, as cytokines and chemokines, um, IL-2, IL-8, uh, TNF-alpha, and, and a whole range of others that then make the epithelial cell receptive for the, for the infection. And, and the data is indicated here. Right? <clears throat> so and this is an example of a facilitator, right? So the, uh, the macrophage essentially produces a cytokine that binds to a cytokine receptor, GPCR in the epithelial cell, that then has nothing to do with the receptor function for the virus. It acts completely separate, but it triggers a, uh, um, a signaling process that uh, turns the epithelial cell into kind of a migratory cell. So it repolarizes the CAR protein on these cells towards the leading edge. And in this case, this would be the apical surface. And hence, the CAR protein and also the integrins are localized where the other viruses are, namely to the lumen of the airways. And they thereby facilitate the infection of the organism un unwantingly. So <clears throat> the, the virus interacts with the CAR, uh, it doesn't interact with the CAR protein on macrophages, but it has another receptor. It has a scavenger receptor. Um, uh, in this case here, in the mouse case here, uh, alveola macrophage case here, it's the scavenger A6 <clears throat> that directly binds to the hexon protein, uh, the hypervariable loop, um, <clears throat> uh, I think it was one, uh, of, on the hexon protein uh, of adeno5 and two, um, but not so much of the D and the D types, um, uh, and not at all uh, to A31, which is lacking this loop. Um, <clears throat> essentially, this receptor there binds and, and aggregates and endocytosis the virus and leads to macrophage uh, invasion for this virus. So that's a different mechanism, right? Independent of CAR, the epithelial mechanism, it's a different thing. <clears throat> But in both cases, the virus faces the problem that it has to penetrate the endosome. And this is an issue that, that is, uh, is, is of, of, of utmost importance also for the gene therapy and the synthetic biology field to break the endosomal or the plasma membrane in a way that uh, doesn't kill the cell and allows delivery of agents into, in, 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 into target cells. So the virus here has solved it by evolving protein six. It's a small protein. I mentioned this, it's inside uh, the virion. It has an amphipathic helix here uh, in black. Um, and the, uh, the on-fast projection of this helix is shown here. You see the hydrophobicity here in, uh, in open uh, uh, letters here and, and the hydrophilicity in dark letters. Um, so it binds, it, it adheres to the membrane and there's a mutant here, L40Q, which lousily uh, uh, tethers to the membrane and poorly uh, 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 breaks the um, endosomal membrane. That's work by Nemerov and, and uh, colleagues here, and that's an in vitro uh, lysis assay that demonstrates the ability of protein-6 and the much less reduced ability of a deletion mutant here, um, <clears throat> uh, Delta 54. So this argues uh, very strongly that this protein-6 is the lytic factor, or at least one of the lytic factors, a major lytic factor, and that it has this antipathic helix to break the membrane. So the question for us experimentalists to understand mechanisms, we need to have assays to um, measure virus penetration. And one of the assays one can think of, um, uh, we have developed a few years ago, is uh, based on streptolysin selective permeabilization of cells, the plasma membrane, with this bacterial toxin that opens holes here in the membrane and allows the perfusion of antibodies into, into the cytosol of these cells. Here's the protocol by which you can do this. Um, this is all published and, and one can apply this to many different agents actually. So this allows you in essence to perfuse an antibody against the virus capsid here. And if the, if the virus is labeled with a fluorophore, you can essentially track uh, single particles, whether or not they are located in the cytosol or in, uh, on the plasma membrane or in endosomes. And the reason why it works is uh, that it does not, under these conditions, uh, permeabilize endosomes because streptolysin O requires cholesterol for binding and for, uh, and, and for pore formation. 
and endolysosomes are lower in cholesterol than the plasma membrane, for example, and are essentially not susceptible to streptolysin under, uh, under, the, uh, under these conditions. So this is shown by the TS1 virus. I mentioned this before. It's a virus that is not mature. It cannot, and it, it can endocytose, but it cannot escape from endosomes. This was uh, shown many years ago <clears throat> uh, in, in by electron microscopy, for example. So this virus remains um, outside and or in endosomes, while the virus, the wild type virus here, uh, very nicely penetrates. But you will notice that. <clears throat> um, the antibody positive particles here usually vary uh, from cell to cell. There are cells where 80% have penetrated under these conditions at these times, and there's other cells where essentially nothing has penetrated. So this is a, an example of endosomal <coughs> penetration variants, and this is probably one of the biggest steps uh, of variability of virus, um, at least of this virus uh, and infection process it takes into cells. And um, it's a very interesting problem to, to look at and, and to better study. So protein 6, <clears throat> uh, I mentioned before, is located inside the virion, right? So there's a conceptual problem. How do you activate protein 6? How do you make it recognize the limiting membrane of the endosome as the virion comes into cells? Right? So this is a, a, a few and of us few from the inside onto the virion um, uh, capsid. Uh, one facet here is shown, the precursor of six here, you see, uh, is, is uh, here in the cavity of the base of the trimeric hexon and uh, essentially is located there. So that's, that's where the protein is, is located. <clears throat> so um, what happens in cells is that the, the protein six um, gets exposed from the incoming virion. And you can see that by indirect immunofluorescence microscopy, for example, where you label the, the variants with uh, a red dye here, APO, and the protein 6 in these uh, fixed cells here by uh, a green uh, secondary antibody, and you score double positive events, and you see after 10 minutes of infection from a cold synchronized state, uh, you see many yellow dots. You see also red dots, uh, which uh, indicates these particles have not exposed 6 or have exposed it and lost it already, because you also see green dots. And these green dots are protein 6 dots that have separated from the virion and gone elsewhere. They have been sequestered. <clears throat> so we don't exactly know what they are, but we assume that these protein 6 dots are located on broken endosomal membranes. And eventually, uh, we know uh, they disappear from these infected cells. And, and we know also that they are autophagocytosed uh, through an autophagic machinery involved in P62 and other things, and, and so they are cleared from the cell. So these broken membranes are, are removed. But protein 6 is exposed here, as you can see, and again, there's, there's significant variability between, between cells and the efficiency they do that. <clears throat> and then eventually, as time progresses here, 20 minutes of infection here, less of the particles become positive for protein 6 because most of them have then already penetrated into the cell cytosol. Now, the mechanism by which protein 6 gets exposed is a mechanical uh, a mechanism that involves two receptors that the virus have. Um, it's involving CAR, the Coxsackie virus receptor here, and these are the CDL cells, so it's binds to the fiber knot, and it's involving the integrins, which binds to penton base here on the fivefold axis. So, CAR has the ability to move on the cell surface. This is all extracellular. So if CAR oligomerizes here, and it does, because it's a multimeric binding to fiber, a trimer, <clears throat> it then attaches to a machinery um, that is mediating retrograde actin flow. So it attaches to a membrane domain that is able to link to actomyosin uh, complexes, and actomyosin is traveling back to the cell body here constantly in these cells. So integrins are not motile, they are static, they are holding back the virion, so that creates a force on the particle, and that ruptures and uh, eventually leads to the loss of the fiber, quantitatively, and also the loss of some of the pentons. And this opens up the virion and protein 6 gets exposed. So as a consequence, when protein 6 gets exposed, <clears throat> um, it is uh, <clears throat> it can interact now with membranes, potentially, or it can diffuse away. So it interacts with membranes um, rather 
in, with naive membranes on the plasma membrane rather inefficiently, um, but it does, and it forms measurable holes into the plasma membrane. They are very small. They are um, estimated to be about uh, 30 to 40 nanometers in size, much smaller than the virion is, but they allow uh, the cell to uh, receive a damage signal from influx of calcium. That's from the extracellular medium, calcium fluxes in, and it triggers a repair process. It triggers the secretion of lysosomes, specialized lysosomes, I mean the secretory lysosomes, they're peripheral in the cell, and that fuses the plasma membrane. And secretory lysosomes deliver uh, a lipid um, modifying uh, protein, the acid sphingomyelinase. And acid sphingomyelinase converts uh, sphingomyelin into ceramide. Now, ceramide now is the entity that protein 6 likes. So protein 6 binds very strongly to ceramide-rich membranes. And as this process here happens in an auto-catalyzed feedback, feed-forward loop here, um, and vesicles um, are getting formed through imagination on the plasma membrane, uh, ceramide accumulates, and as the virus is opening up and releasing protein 6, this protein 6 binds to ceramide on these in, the emerging uh, butts here and, and the endosomes, and eventually reaches sufficient concentrations then to lyse and to rupture the, uh, the membrane and, and to give rise to cytosolic variants then uh, here in, in, in the cytoplasm. <clears throat> and then uh, these broken membranes, they are sorted away and, um, and cleared. And the variant is in the cytosol. It then traffics, and this is another feature then that the virus uh, has built in. It has built in the ability to bind motor proteins. And it does not just bind one motor protein, it binds two motor proteins of opposite polarity, namely dynein and kinesin-1. And that's work here uh, depicted from the lab of Richard Valley, a, a motor lab, a dynein specialist lab in New York, who has <clears throat> pioneered these, um, these studies here. And essentially what, uh, what it means is that the virus is moving in both directions, back and forth on microtubules by these two motors. This allows it to uh, also enter cells where the polarity of the, of the microtubules is inverse from a normal fried egg phenotype uh, cell, for example, as we all know it in fibroblasts, for example, at the minus end of microtubules is, approximately, is proximal to the cell nucleus. Um, in polarized epithelial cells, it's different. The minus end is up on the plasma membrane here on the apical uh, uh, border here, and the plus end is towards the cell center here or towards the nucleus. So <clears throat> this is uh, then a situation where the virus prefers probably uh, the use of kinesin. And in this situation here, uh, the virus prefers to use dynein here, right, depending on the context. But in both cases, it works, it traffics bidirectionally. And this can be seen actually by long tracking of these, fiber motion, of these virus motions, single particle motions, where one can see very fast directed motions, motor-driven, microtubule dependent. Uh, one can see slower motions as well, fast drifting motions, also motor dependent, microtubule dependent, and then slow drifting motions that are a different kind of motion. But this is important because you see here that the variance size inversely correlates with the speed of the particles. So meaning that the larger you have, that the larger your particle is, essentially, and that's taken from the literature, the slower it gets, actually. So uh, this is very, uh, uh, very intuitive here. If you look at this uh, diffusion uh, um, uh, uh, equation here, and, um, that essentially uh, inversely correlates with the, the radius of the, uh, of the particle, the diffusion constant. So you do need, if you are a certain size of a particle here, uh, you definitely need assisted motion to move in the cytoplasm. Otherwise, you get stuck and, and you are not doing anything or you're not reaching uh, at the, the point where you want to uncoat. So <clears throat> this is the, the rationale. So in terms of mechanism, <clears throat> uh, there's lots of host factors in there. And one of the, the questions that, that you have been interested in uh, is, is how does the virus deliver its DNA in the nucleus? <clears throat> um, so uh, a few years ago, we engaged in a genome-wide RNAi screen for host factors of virus infection, essentially scoring the infection of, um, of a GFP virus here, uh, an adenovirus driving GFP. 
uh, from the E3B region, this is the promoter, so this gives rise to green cells. And now when you individually knock down a certain gene of interest in these multi-well formats, uh, you can score infection uh, individually and, uh, and then uh, you find hits that, uh, or siRNAs that produce infection here, the set score, or that enhance infection here, right? <clears throat> So in the course of these experiments, we learned that these RNA ice creams, and we, we did quite a few of those, <laughs> um, are very noisy, uh, meaning that uh, the hits that you get uh, are uh, mostly either false positive or false negative. So you need some patience, actually, and you need some good follow-up studies to, um, uh, to find the pearls in this, uh, in this, uh, in this kind of situation. So <clears throat> Michael Bauer found it, and uh, one of the pearls is a ubiquitin ligase, uh, MIP1, mind bomb one a protein that is normally localized to the centriolar satellites around the, <coughs> uh, the, the centrosome here. So you see this puncta here from a paper published a few years ago by another group here. <clears throat> um, that's where the protein localizes. It's involved in a developmental uh, signaling processes, notch signaling, ciliogenesis, cell migration, neurogenesis. Uh, a lot of functions here actually have been described for mind bomb one and now surprisingly also uh, for virus infection. So mind bomb one is a ubiquitin ligase. It's a ring finger ubiquitin ligase that has a, a catalytic domain here in the C-terminus uh, of, uh, of, of about a thousand, more than a thousand amino acids actually. Um, it has a critical cysteine here that it requires for uh, activity. It has anchoring repeats here, it has a repetitive domain here, and it has a uh, substrate binding domain here uh, on the end terminus as well. So what Michael did here after the screen uh, with the RNAi, <coughs> he made the knockouts with the CRISPR-Cas and uh, he could show they are clean. And in fact, they completely prevent infection here, except this one cell, if this is a cell here that is still green, uh, may have survived or may have been infected here. <clears throat> so the CRISPRing has uh, led to the editing of the genome here and insertion of a T here at this, um, at this position here in all the loci of these cells. So it is, it is a very complete and very strong phenotype. Here. So MIP1 turned out was required for entry of the virus and in particular for genome uncoating at the nuclear pore. Because the phenotype of the knockout cell in terms of virus entry was that uh, the variants here in the uh, guide MIB1 knockout cells here was all at the nuclear pore, whereas in the controls here it was initially at the nuclear pore at one hour, but then the variants were uncoated and disappeared from the nuclear pores. So this is all complicated. So importantly, the induction of uh, mind bomb one by doxycycline. Uh, ectopically in the knockout uh, background uh, has not only led to the appearance of the protein here in white, but also to the release of the viral DNA from the docked uh, situation of the particle at the nuclear pore. See, this is the situation before induction of um, mind bomb one, which is flag tagged, and you can see it now, or GFB tagged even. So um, after one hour it already start, of induction, it already started to uncoat, and after six hours, it was very prominent. So you hardly see any yellow uh, signal anymore, you, but instead you see the green signal from the hexon and the red signal from the viral DNA, which is click chemistry labeled and, uh, and is, is now indicated to be free. And <clears throat> most of the DNA, but not all of the DNA, I have to stress this, is <clears throat> essentially, um, here in, in this case here is inside the nucleus, but some of it is misdelivered into the cytoplasm. That's a very interesting process actually that we need to understand better. So <clears throat> this is the model um, that, uh, that we have so far. So the variants dock, um, they are um, stably bound to the nuclear pores here. There's an interaction between KN214 and the hexon that stabilizes these particles. And as soon as mind bomb one gets expressed here, it, its ubiquitination activity is required to give rise to ubiquitination of one of the variant proteins here um, in, in the particle here. Um, and, and we're following up on that actually and, uh, and, and clarifying which one it is. <clears throat> uh, and this is then allowing um, uh, the disassembly of the variant 
uh, by the action of the kinesin uh, force that is uh, also working at the nuclear pore um, and, and breaking up the DNA uh, from the capsid and allowing the DNA then to get into the, into the nucleus. So this is this. Um, uh, a few more examples actually of what viruses are doing. Um, viruses, um, uh, obviously they persist, right? Some of them, and they may last for a lifetime and also antivirus is able to persist. So this happens, persistence happens. And this is, uh, you know, a feature um, that is, is, is quite common in virus infections and, uh, and, and has to be studied in, in much more detail actually and understood much better because it, it, determines, um, it determines immune reactions and, and the way the virus causes disease. So if a primary infection is not cleared by the immune system, then uh, we are talking persistent viruses. But the genome needs to be active, it needs to be produced in, in, in low amounts perhaps. And, um, and, and it, it has to remain detectable sometimes, even in the absence of viral proteins. And, uh, and, and there are just some examples here. So <clears throat> it is a problem actually medically because persistent infections can give rise to, um, let's say disseminated disease um, when a person is immunosuppressed. And depending on the kind of immunosuppression uh, that occurs, um, uh, different viruses can emerge uh, from, uh, from persistence. And the antivirus, for example, emerges from persistence when hematopoietic stem, cell, um, uh, cell, stem cells are uh, transplanted into uh, recipients and the immune system gets suppressed there. And, and, and this, the, the, essentially the, the antiviruses break out from lymphoid cells mostly. So the model here of persistence um, is interesting and essentially, uh, but a complete, uh, totally incomplete. Um, we just know that it is uh, importantly regulated by the immediate early protein of the virus E1A. And uh, uh, the lack of time actually doesn't allow me to go deeper here into E1A, but in essence, what type 1 and type 2 interferon is doing actually, it is um, essentially uh, leading to the silencing of uh, even a expression um, and, uh, and, and hence uh, the inactivation of virus because even a is the protein that drives all the viral promoters and is absolutely required for, uh, <coughs> for making a, a lytic infection. So even a is very important. <coughs> so the, uh, the question of how the virus can persist um, uh, under the pressure of interferon uh, is, is, is obvious and, and important. And uh, uh, for a student now postdoc in, in Germany, uh, Dibu Prasad in my lab has uh, worked out a five components uh, mechanism by which the E1A uh, promoter is controlled through a feed forward, positive feed forward loop um, involving the unfolded protein response here. Um, <clears throat> so the virus um, we have seen delivers its genome into the nucleus. Um, and, um, and there the E1A uh, through its enhancer promoter can become active um, at, at a rather low efficiency maybe initially, uh, gives rise to a messenger RNA that gets translated in the cytoplasm, E1A protein gets made, and E1A now transactivates uh, essentially all the early promoters, including the E3 promoter. And E3 harvests um, one of the uh, open reading frames that is in there is the E3 um, 19K protein. It's a membrane protein that is binding here in, uh, as we worked out, binding to the uh, IRE1 unfolded protein response sensor. And IRE1 is able to uh, activate and give rise to alternative splicing of a messenger RNA encoding a transcription factor, XPP1S spliced, which then goes back into the nucleus, binds to the E1A enhancer promoter, and enhances the E1A expression. So this loop um, essentially maintains the viral genome in the presence of interferon um, for many, many weeks. So in these cultured cells, for many weeks. And if you remove interferon, the virus breaks out of these uh, persistence. It, it becomes lytic, kills the cells. 
uh, or if you uh, interfere with the loop here, with any of the components here of this loop, for example, inhibiting the IRE1 uh, nuclease function, uh, then again, the virus um, is, um, is, is, uh, is controlled by interferon and it is eliminated. Then. So this loop here is just one, of, one example here of how a virus has evolved with the cell to maintain itself and to um, essentially adapt itself to the environment and survive the uh, immune uh, pressure. <clears throat> so I think uh, I can skip this. Um, systemic use of vectors is difficult as we start to learn. And um, of course, this is not new, um, but uh, it is a message that, uh, that is important, I think. Vectors can be neutralized pre-existing antibodies. So one has to use and switch serotypes and get around the, this, uh, this problem. Vectors can be immunogenic and uh, especially if encountered for the first time. And sometimes they can only be used once. Again, immunosuppression medication may, may help or the switch of a new serotype. Um, <clears throat> vectors can be sequestered by the liver. And this is extremely well studied here, for example, uh, uh, in the case of adenovirus here, also through the cooked cells here in, 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 um, and, and then also hepatocytes. Clearance actually happens, blood factor binding, inactivation, detargeting happens here. Uh, and importantly, if you systemically apply viruses, they can promiscuously infect and, and, and they can infect cells that you don't want to have infected actually. And, um, and sometimes they even in, inefficiently enter a target cell here because of cell to cell variability or of, of existing immunity or, or some other reasons. No, it's very complicated. So one of the things that we are trying to do with the Plictone lab here at the University of Zurich is we try to rationally shield the virus and rationally target the virus to, to receptors here through the darkening technology, um, uh, attaching uh, these, these uh, uh, trimerization, um, uh, uh, trimerized uh, proteins here to the fiber knob here and, and engineering a uh, retargeting moiety here. That's what they do and they target uh, cancer cell receptors, for example, um, in the presence of a uh, shield that hides away the, um, some of the immunogenic epitopes of the particles, but also hides away the ability of uh, blood factors to, to bind and to complement mediate the destruction of this virus or to deliver the virus to the, uh, <clears throat> to the liver and, and destroy this one. So this is just a little outlook. So the take home of all this um, discussion today uh, would be that we uh, consider um, or we have considered and looked at what the virus is, what they do, how it is maintained in an infected cell, um, what it takes to build a virus, um, some of the principles, components and emerging features have been discussed and how they interfere and facilitate uh, infection. Um, it's important to consider the systemic features of a virus if, and, and, uh, and, of course, of the virion itself, if you want to apply this knowledge to, to therapy. And um, obviously, uh, one feature is that is, is always to be kept in mind is that viral genomes can be maintained and, um, and, and, and underlying mechanisms are important for disease uh, onset and, and develop. So with this, <clears throat> um, I come to the conclusion um, and I would like to acknowledge all the people in the lab that have helped to uh, progress with this work and some of the collaborators here I've mentioned throughout the talk here as well. Some of them I haven't mentioned actually, uh, I haven't had time to that. And uh, here, some of the funding that we have received over the years also to support this work. With this, um, um, I'm, I'm at the end and I'll be happy to take questions if you have any. Uh, in this format. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Urs, uh, for this deep insight into the adenovirus host interaction. We learned a lot. And um, before I start with the first question, I would like on to encourage our audience to type in the questions, which I then uh, pass on to you. So, let's see. The first question is from Marina Pavlo from the University of Munich. And she said, very interesting talk. I was wondering if you could comment on the fluorescent tagging of virions. How do you achieve this and would it be applicable to AV? So we uh, very generically use um, 
uh, succinamide ester uh, activated fluorophores that attach then uh, the fluorophore to amino groups um, uh, of the virion on the cell surface. Uh, yes, um, so with a good microscope and a great signal to noise, you can easily do that also with AAV particles and, and to, to check that tracking. I think there's reports in the literature on that as well. Uh, it's a bit more challenging maybe than with adenovirus because the AAVs are considerably smaller and they do not tolerate as many fluorophores um, uh, per virion maybe as, as, as the adenovirus would tolerate. So an issue is always there that the particles aggregate if you overconjugate them. And obviously you change a little bit the properties of the particle, right? And you, and you have to put uh, many fluorophores in, into... So with the adeno, we have, um, we have dozens of, of fluorophores, probably a um, hundred or more maybe uh, per particle. So they are really standing out very brightly and, and they can be tracked. Uh, over a long time in, in these, these microscopy experiments. Thank you. So um, regarding the blood factors which are binding to the adenovirus, can you comment a little bit more on that? Because in particular, if it comes to also the viral vectors which we use in gene and cell therapy or try to develop for gene and cell therapy, we commonly ignore a bit what happens if we inject something intravenously and what the vectors are seeing there. So maybe it would be helpful if you could comment regarding the ad, what happens with the blood factors. Yeah, so there's many blood factors binding and there's a vast amount of literature on that as well. So factor 10 is one of the things. Um, <clears throat> and factor 10 then is associated with liver uptake, uh, kupfer cell uptake um, of these complex particles. But there's another uh, thing ha that also happens is that complement actually uh, 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 targets to, to virus. So pre-existing Antibodies, low affinity ones, maybe IgMs, uh, can uh, repetitively uh, can can uh, can recognize these repetitive units on these particles, and um, and without specific immunity, can then lead to uh, destruction of these particles. In fact, the ten may help preventing that. Right, so <laughs> so there's two problems there, right? So the so the particles are uh, cleared by the complement, and they are targeted to the to the liver, and um, in a way, one has to control that, and, and uh, the way Plukton's lab has um, engineered now um, these these adenos um, is by using uh, <clears throat> a single chain, a trimerizing single chain against the hexon protein, covering a large surface area of the particles, preventing factor ten and other things from binding, and that has a much much increased half life in in the blood. Um, of these mice, um, the, the virus doesn't go to the liver anymore. Challenge now is to get the virus to the to the cancer or to the site where you want to have it uh, in the context of an immunocompetent uh, system. Right, so this yeah. is the challenge. Yeah, this also brings me to another question. So when we look at the virus, and you nicely showed us this, there's a very complicated system how the virus and the cell have evolved and whom is helping was what, so that the virus really gets the in this case, the DNA to the nucleus. So, and when we, and also then you told us about maintaining, so maintenance of the adenovirus. So when it now comes to the vectors, um, so as long as it is somehow the capsid, um, it's somehow uh, we stick to that. But uh, all the other necessary factors for the virus interaction, we uh, commonly deplete because we need space or whatsoever. So, um, when we now look, for example, for the maintenance of ad and this nice uh, feedback of loop you explained. So, what do you think? Uh, can we can we learn from our to the vector? What we, how should we modify the vectors to to adapt them to the system better? Oh, this is a great question. Actually, you are really hitting at the weak uh, spot here of of the system. <clears throat> Obviously, the virus has evolved proteins that exactly help that the maintenance of the genome, yeah. and, and now the vectors have lost all of these things. <laughs> so the the viral genome is is essentially unprotected, and yeah. will be eliminated uh, sooner or later um, by by the host defense uh, machinery. 
you can hope that maybe cancer cells have less of this defense um, and and may tolerate uh, more or longer lived um, you know residents of this foreign DNA. But um, it's a challenge actually to um, to think about that and. Uh, Maybe to, to understand it conceptually, one has to stepwise uh, build up the system again uh, with decentral viral proteins to find out where the major problem is for the kind of therapy that one wants to achieve. So one can do this or start to do this, of course, with the gutless viruses um, that essentially are devoid of any viral sequence except the ITRs. Um, that that would then be a starting point to to rebuild the system in a way um, and 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 try to understand, uh, you know, but, but if you, if you look at E1A, I, E1A is such a small protein, um, 289 amino acids in its longest form and uh, has this um, natively, uh, this in intrinsically disordered uh, nature that allows it to bind to so many different things. So um, it's not just progressing the cell into S phase then, um, it's, it's, it's also interfering with the, uh, with the interference system and, and doing many, many other things um, uh, to, yeah, to, to build that back uh, is, is, um, is going to be, uh, is going to be a challenge. Yeah, and maybe also we have unwanted side effects. If you, for example, have a look at the HEC293, which have the E1As um, overexpressed and uh, is thereby immortalized, right? Um, but you are right, we have to build somehow, or this is maybe a solution that we uh, try to really build the, the variants from stretch. And that somehow brings me back to the synthetic viruses, right? Because somehow they are now at the, um, they, they hook more and more of the features back, which variants has and try just to use the best. And maybe we have to go back to the, uh, to the viral vectors and do something similar. Yeah, yeah. So we have another question from Carsten Lederer, who says, are you aware of any attempts to improve efficiency of perinuclear accumulation of viruses and thus of improving nuclear import by including dynein ligands in the virion or the capsid of the viral vectors? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's, <clears throat> that, that is a very, very good question. Also, we don't have any engineering insight into that. Um, so we haven't studied this one to one. Um, I, I couldn't tell you, but yes, obviously this is something that you may want to want. You um, you want the motor attachment um, ability of, of your of your particle to get there. So so dynein is 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 as you correctly mentioned is bring the, the particles close to the nucleus in these um, in these epithelial uh, uh, nonpolar cells. Um, but it's not sufficient to get them to the nuclear pore um, because they need to detach from the microtubules um, and they need to, um, in order to find efficiently the nuclear pores. And so there's something else that is necessary. So uh, we don't exactly know what molecule it is that detaches the virion from the microtubules and from the ina or kinesin uh, as, they approximate, as they approximate the nucleus. But there is a factor that is sensitive to nuclear export inhibitors that gets out of the nucleus and then releases the variants from the proximal microtubules. So it's a gradient of activity that uh, only works on microtubules in a very proximal, maybe a micrometer or so close to the nucleus, but not the distantly located one. So there's more complexity in there. And, and you also need that to work for getting the virion to the nuclear pore. But in principle, I mean, that sounds like a great idea, right? If we, if someone can figure out the next step, then to combine this. Yes. So, <clears throat> um, it, another feature actually of these motors and the viruses is that there's not too many motors on the virion. So, if you make uh, too efficient docking or recruitment of the motors uh, for uh, for your particle. Uh, you may um, reach effects that, um, that, that that would be difficult to control, maybe. <laughs> but it would be interesting to, to do anyway. Um, so simulation experiments indicated that you have maybe one to two motors actually bound to virions because and, and that's based on the on on the frequency that these viruses switch direction. 
So they, they do that very frequently. And if you have too many motors of one kind, you cannot release them um, coordinately in order to switch direction. So this is a, a kind of a modeling uh, uh, data information <clears throat> that we have, we have derived a um, number of years ago uh, by stochastic modeling. Uh, Petros Komutsakos actually has done this work um, based on, on real life data um, in cells. So <clears throat> yeah, it would be interesting actually to see uh, what it is. But, but then there's another thing actually for the adenovirus uh, peculiarity, uh, very interesting work uh, from Richard Valley uh, that suggested that um, you need cell signaling uh, through protein kinase A in order to uh, detach dynein from endolysosomes to phosphorylate that. And the phosphorylated form of um, dynein then is the one that binds to the virus particle. So this implies that dynein normally is quite busy in the cell. It's used for vesicular transport. It's not just hanging out there and available, but you need to activate it somehow. Or you need to actively recruit it. And the virus has found a way to, to do that. And, and we have published in more than oh, 19 years ago, uh, 2001, <laughs> that indeed the incoming virus activates protein kinase A and, and the peak is up to at about 10 to 15 minutes of infection. So these primes apparently now by, based on the work from, from Bali and colleagues, <clears throat> primes the, the dynein uh, for recruitment to the virion once it then has, has penetrated the cytosol. And that then brings it back to, uh, to microtubal tracts and, and, and towards the nucleus. And that's what, what we have shown that inhibiting PKA uh, by, <clears throat> by uh, chemical inhibitors uh, vastly reduced the uh, uh, nuclear transport of the virion. That's really cool. Um, so maybe I, I have a last question, if I may. So when, when it comes to the example you were giving in the lung, so how adenovirus somehow um, has convinced um, or has recruited macrophages for help, so, I mean, this, this looks from an evolutionary point of view like a very complicated communication system to really be then able to, to use this as an infectious parse. Um, so, any, any clue how such a complicated interaction can, can evolve? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, obviously, that, <laughs> there must be a reason actually for, <laughs> for, uh, for the way these macrophage cytokines are changing the physiology of the of these epithelial cells, also independent of the virus necessarily. <clears throat> so, uh, so one paradigm there is that <clears throat> the uh, so so CAR is involved in cell cell adhesion uh, interactions. So, it's it is a homophilic contacts of CAR. So, there's no free CAR available on these epithelial cells. But free CAR is necessary to activate and coordinate the function of gamma delta T cells in the inflamed uh, mucosal epithelium. So this may be the reason why, <clears throat> why the macrophages actually uh, uh, locally depolarize uh, these, um, these epithelial cells in order for them to, um, to coordinate and, um, and, and make more efficient the immune response. And the virus is essentially capitalizing on, on this kind of machinery uh, and has been, uh, you know, efficient enough to select this, this protein um, uh, as a receptor. But we should not forget that, that, um, that all the, um, you know, all, all these receptors um, that we think are functioning in entry uh, might also have a function in egress, in exit of the virus, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so when when uh, when the virus gets out of the cell and and there is car uh, available um, that is free on 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 the cell surface, um, it may interfere with the efficient transmission of the virus. So it has to deal with this as well. So using a car that that, that is then maybe involved in cell adhesions um, uh, and 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 busy with these things would maybe better allow the egress of the virus. You know, that's speculation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we, ha we have to, to stop now. So uh, thanks again for this uh, great lecture. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm.
And uh, I would like also to invite our audience to join us next week when we start the second part of the e-school for which is on production. Um, and we start with the talk of Hannah Lesch, who is giving us an insight into the production of gamma and lentiviral vectors. And by this, I say goodbye and thanks again, Urs. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much, uh, Hildegard. Okay. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.